This webinar is brought to you by the Regulatory Services Partnership, uh, thanks to generous funding from European Union's Regional Development Fund. We're going to be looking at the hospitality industry today, which includes our pubs, clubs, restaurants and guest accommodation. A little bit of a small print out of the way, views expressed by any speaker or the speakers alone don't necessarily represent the views of UK Government, European Commission or the body the speaker represents. You will hear some science about virus transmission, uh, effectiveness of face coverings. This information is sourced from various studies internationally. It will be made available in the follow-up information if you want to dive into the detail. And it's provided merely to support businesses understand the context of the guidance and or the views that you'll hear today. It is all fast moving, the virus, the science, what we know about it, thus the advice of what we think are safe, uh, adequate safety measures is constantly evolving as well. Whilst efforts have been made to make sure this is all up to date, please recognise that we're regulators, not scientists, and some aspects may not reflect the most recent scientific thinking, nor is it necessarily comprehensive of the law or the science. You should seek your own legal and scientific views, uh, sorry, advice, where appropriate. This is based upon English law. The official guidance may differ in different parts of the UK. I feel much of this is talking about practical guidance, um, which will be useful to any business anywhere in the UK. Mention of or participation by any business or body during the webinar doesn't necessarily amount to a recommendation by the council. We've neither vetted them nor confirmed their premise to be COVID secure. Uh, and the webinar has been recorded for the benefit of all businesses in your sector who are not able to join us today. So now the small prints out of the way. Who are we? Regulated Services Partnership. We are council-owned service. We serve the London boroughs of Merton, Richmond upon Thames and Wandsworth. Uh, with over 50 highly trained staff in different uh, sections of local authority. Um, we are typically the range of services that you as a business would interact with, with a, a local authority. Um, we have an advisory and enforcement role in respect of COVID regulations. Um, so our focus is on advice first, enforcement as a last resort. Now I did say we're based in London, but you may be viewing this via your trade associations, in different parts of the UK. We are here to offer further more detailed advice to local businesses um, but if you have more questions that come up uh, out of this webinar you can go to your local authority environment health department and or your uh, national trade association. So the speakers today are myself Paul Maloszewski reed I'm a Charter Trading Standards Practitioner and Ravina Puruel, who's our health and safety inspector, he goes out and does the COVID risk assessments to businesses. We both uh, work for the RSP and we're joined by industry speakers Andrew Green, policy manager with the British Beer and Pub Association, and Richard Clifford, policy manager at UK Hospitality. Quick overview, this is about a 40 to 60 minute webinar, uh, we'll include in Q&A, so we'll talk about the science, We'll talk about practical steps to reduce risk in your premise, uh, refer to you to the trade association's own guidance, uh, mention face coverings, visors and gloves. There's been lots of queries around that, what's appropriate, et cetera. Uh, how you bring customers back, thinking about recovering the cost of these safety measures um, and linking into other financial other support that's available. And uh, thinking about what you can do to safeguard your sector from a second shutdown. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A with a panel of uh, speakers. Uh, for that purpose, purpose, please use the chat function. So some context. Um, we've heard lots of things over the last four months. So it's important that we all have a kind of basic understanding of uh, what we know today, because the science has changed quite significantly. Um, so as soon as we talk, breathe, cough, um, et cetera, we have, uh, droplets um, that are released from our mouth, some we can, some we can't see, these start shrinking straight away from dehydration as soon as they leave our mouth. As example, in this nice little picture to the left, so there's large droplets that fall to the floor quite quickly and then there's these smaller ones. So the World Health Organization advice from the start has been pretty much along the lines of the virus is transmitted through these larger droplets when we cough and sneeze. And because they're large, these droplets fall quickly down to surfaces. Therefore, we need to do a lot more cleaning. And because we're touching surfaces, we need to do a lot more hand washing. 
Um, and that's why we need these kind of barriers uh, between staff and customers. So visors for faces, screens in between different tables of customers, etc. Now, international scientific opinion has evolved quite a lot. So um, they now say there's strong evidence to suggest that the virus actually spreads throughout the air through these much tinier microscopic particles that don't drop to the floor within a few meters, but they're so light, they just float around. And this is when we're talking, we're breathing out, not simply coughing and, and sneezing. Now that really kind of changes uh, the game here. Um, and these particles can float around for hours, up to days, um, and they can travel through a building via air currents, air con. Um, so you need to think about this in terms of customers talking, breathing in your premise. 80% of those with the virus show no, or mild symptoms, um, it's around about 60% they reckon have no, show no symptoms at all. So uh, the point is most people uh, with the virus uh, will be unaware they have it. Um, of though that minority, roughly 20%, that do go on to show symptoms, there's a high rate of transmission, so they transmit the virus to others to a high degree up to two days before symptoms, such as high temperature, et cetera, shows. So these people with the virus, uh, you know, uh, unknown to them, they're carrying it, they're working, socializing, shopping as normal. And it's important to be mindful of this because when you're designing safety pr uh, procedures, you know, it's not just for the person that's got an obvious cough, um, who perhaps knows they've got a virus, but is coming in laissez-faire and not caring about the rules and, and others. It is Joe public, the majority of people that are walking around, um, uh, uh, um, trying to do the right thing uh, and yet they don't realize they're carrying the virus and, and spreading it uh, when they're around others. So obviously it's great most industries have got permission to reopen, continue trading, um, but having that legal permission uh, doesn't mean it's always safe to do so. You need to look at the risks in your premise, not just for yourself, but your staff, your customers, obviously you as the people managing and owning these businesses, you don't want to I pick up the virus and, and risk bringing that in, into your circle, personal circles. And also you want to avoid the, any requirements to close down because of an incident in your premise. So there's some steps that you should consider. Bear in mind what I've said about the, the virus, move business outdoors, uh, customer queues, seating, waiting areas. You might not have a uh, large uh, pavement, so find solutions by talking to your neighboring businesses. Uh, they may have a forecourt, for example, and they're happy for, to lend that for, for your business. Um, there's very little risk outdoors. So uh, from over 300 outbreaks covering around 7,000 uh, carriers, only one was connected to outdoor transmission, and that related to just two individuals. This is because the virus um, aerosols, these small particles typically delete very quickly in the air uh, to such an extent that they don't pose a risk. So just simply a gentle breeze can be enough to carry those particles away and dilute them uh, in the air um, to keep us safe. So with that in mind, there's two options. One is fast track pavement licenses. Um, however, those are really about facilitating outdoor seating for those selling food and drink. Um, in the follow-up information, there's a link to uh, all the very comprehensive Q&A around that. Um, but noting it's only for food and drink, that may not cover um, every uh, sector in the hospitality industry. Um, and so if you want those same benefits, I suggest you talk to your trade association who can lobby government and, and make those views known on your behalf. The other option is uh, by talking to your, your local authority. Local authorities, the police are offering real practical support. Um, Whatever has happened in the past in terms of noise complaints, serial complainers, you may have had um, bad dealings with local council, environment health, police, um, because of those kinds of issues. Um, I've been doing lots of these webinars with police and other regulators, and it's a very, very different um, way of thinking now. It's a very pragmatic approach. So regulators, the police are 110% behind businesses. Um, 
obviously with the push to go outdoors and open windows and doors as well, there will be a lot more noise. Um, and we are taking a pragmatic approach. People need to realize this is a new way of working until we're past this epidemic. Um, and so this is just one example of a, a practical steps of councils doing. Um, they're narrowing the roads, widening the pavement, so lots of premises up and down the street can get at their tables and chairs outside where it's a lot safer. The disadvantage to doing that is it's a higher risk. So before the pandemic, we had you know, a threat of terrorism in the UK. The police tell us that uh, it's still a substantial risk, which means an attack is likely. However, we're not aware of any um, specific uh, local threats uh, at this point. Uh, obviously, this changes from day to day, week to week, um, but you do need to be mindful of this as you uh, 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 operate in a way where your customers are more outdoors. There are some practical steps to keep your customers safe. So street furniture is a visual deterrent. You'll notice in the H&M example, uh, people are queuing to the right of those metal silver barriers. If they just queue to the left, that would act as a deterrent to anybody uh, driving a car who wanted to harm them. You're not always going to have lampposts, other street furniture outside your premise, so you can think about putting things like large plant troughs. Um, and you might think, well, that's not going to stop a vehicle. Well, this is on a par with um, burglar alarms. Yeah. Um, when you uh, studies have been done talking to burglars, they tell us um, that they would rather go to a property without a burglar alarm because it's obviously a lot easier. Um, and that is a similar uh, mindset that uh, a terrorist will have. They will look for the easy targets. So whilst the vehicle could uh, potentially uh, you know, go through that trough, it, there's no point in them thinking about that if there's an easy target next door. And so you need to think about what you can do to keep your premise looking uh, as safe as possible to uh, those potential uh, terrorists. There is lots uh, of detailed advice and training for, for owners around this. This is an app created by the Met Police Counterterrorism Branch called PSO London Shield. Um, although it's, uh, it's got a London focus, there is lots of advice and information that's uh, helpful to any business anywhere in the UK. So you can download that for free from Google or Apple. So those were steps that you should consider, um, steps that you must take. We've heard from businesses, well, it's only guidance, this sector guides, because it talks about uh, you should consider this or uh, please do that. Um, the guidance is guidance, but it's got um, uh, some statute backing up in terms of uh, health and safety laws, which says that every single business must do a risk assessment and every business that identifies risk to customers and staff must minimize those risks. Now, government has, in combination with your trade association and scientists, has created these sector guides because they've looked at your sector and thought these are the key risks and these are ways that you can uh, reduce them. So it's kind of taking some of the legwork out for you in terms of identifying what risks are potentially within your type of business. Um, and so whilst um, I'm really kind of trying to answer some queries that we've had in the past from other businesses, some have said, well, what if I don't follow this guidance or I don't do this? And they've said, well, what's going to happen? Uh, obviously, enforcement is a risk. Uh, you may get fined, you may get some sort of formal action against you, but I would suggest that that is really the least of your worries. Um, if you, you'll be aware, just as any of us have seen in the news, businesses that in the UK that have had a, an outbreak, uh, they've been on the national news, uh, that will likely affect their reputation, they may have to shut down for a week or two doing deep cleans, um, even when they uh, reopen uh, and the losses that stem from that uh, close, uh, time they had to close down, some of their customers may not feel comfortable going back. Um, there may be insurance repercussions if you didn't follow the guidance. So those are the things that you need to be mindful of and, and they will be a lot more expensive uh, than uh, an enforcement fine, I would, I would think. So where do you start? Because there's lots of guidance um, out there. I appreciate everybody's just trying to survive and run a business. Um, and this is all new to you. So 
this is a, a good place to start. Go to this website, the gov.uk coronavirus-business-reopening. You answer five, six questions there of the type of business and size, and it will then give you um, uh, exactly the advice that's appropriate, relevant to you. So you'll get the government guide or guides relevant to your sector. I say guides because you may be a business that um, is, you know, for example, a pub. It's serving food, so there's uh, FSA uh, risk assessment guidance, um, the hospitality guidance from government. You might also have staff meetings there, so you've also, you're also an office. So sometimes there's more than one guide that's relevant uh, to you. Um, where possible, download the guidance because the download version has um, a PDF version, rather well, that's a tick box, so you can kind of check these off as you go through the different things that you have to think about. You can satisfy yourself that you've went through all of those uh, risks. But also, uh, once you've done that, do look at the trade association guides because those are a lot more personalized to your profession. Um, I've looked than a lot of these for different sectors and generally speaking, the trade association guides, one, uh, those people writing them uh, kind of live and breathe your industry. They are getting a lot of queries uh, from your peers uh, in your industry. So they, they, in terms of the FEQs that you'll see in there, um, they're a lot more personalized, go into a lot more detail. So they, they are really helpful. Uh, I mentioned you do a risk assessment. Now, obviously I've, I've just said there's a checkbox, a tick box um, in the PDF version, but please don't see risk assessment as a tick box exercise, you know? I have to do this because government have said I need to go through this guide. It needs to be unique to you. And the government uh, checklist there, there is no checklist that will be unique enough, personalized enough to your business. You know your business. Um, there will be a huge difference in your risk assessment from one pub to another pub, from one hairdresser to another hairdresser. Even if you're the same profession, um, the risk assessment will change depending on how many staff you have, size of your indoor, outdoor space, configuration of seating, uh, everything about your premise can change the risks associated in there. I will just say this, think of it in terms of customer journey before they visit, once they're in the door, um, you know, the fact they need to open doors, once they're in there, they use your services, uh, they might go up to the bar for drinks or table services is recommended now, they use toilets, you know, walk through a typical consumer journey and you will that will help you identify risks as the the virtual customer goes through your premise um, and obviously as the exit um, things to think about then similar uh, uh, thing with your suppliers and similar thing with your staff just example to give a bit of an inkling in the, the level of detail that you need to go into before staff even come to your your place of work they've had to travel to get there so if we're worn a face covering they need to bag that up, keep it safe. Um, after work, they might be wearing uniforms. Their clothes are a low risk, but they can become contaminated. So you need to give them advice, change clothes, wash them at 60, not 40, because we're all environmentally friendly, aren't we? Um, wash hands thoroughly after touching. And some of these things might seem common sense, but not everybody will think about doing these things. These are new to everybody, so do uh, you need to give that sort of level of advice to staff and that level of training guidance in all the processes, uh, measures that you implement. Now, let's talk about practical steps to reduce risk indoors. We've had months of fear in the media around, you know, the virus living on surfaces up to three days, so we all need to clean everything uh, all the time. Uh, and naturally, there's been a lot of fear or concern around that. Well, no, the knowledge in this area has, has evolved as well. So we now know the amount of virus in a surface drops by half after a few hours, and then it continues dropping. Um, and so, um, you know, if a virus was in a surface, it's left overnight, that the number of viruses is still alive, the next day will be uh, significantly less. Um, because the science has evolved, this is why you'll see countries changing their advice to the effect of, saying surfaces aren't thought to be the main way the virus spreads. Clean and hand, cleaning and hand washing is still important, clearly, but the focus really is on the highest risk, uh, which is the aerosols. You know, these are the airborne particles floating around for hours or days, potentially. 
Um, good ventilation is um, the key here. That's the priority to reduce risk. Uh, so there are um, 15 practical recommendations that you'll get from heating and air con experts in the follow-up information. Um, this includes from the basics, open all the doors and windows. Uh, although that said, sometimes opening every window can be counter, uh, uh, counterintuitive or counterproductive rather, because it, what you're trying to do is get in a fresh air supply. So it may be that opening just certain windows and doors encourages the flow of air through your premise. It all depends on type of premise, the way, where the windows are facing and obviously the, how it interacts with the street. So you do what's right for your premise to get as much ventilation in, in as possible. You can use vans, fans and air con, that's fine, but please do read the air con uh, unit advice that comes in the follow up because there are certain things you need to, to tweak for the air con unit to ensure it is, uh, it is operating safely. Um, you may need to consider stopping staff activities where the two or more people are in an unventilated, an unventilated area for 30 minutes or more. So it goes into a range of things. That's just a few examples. Social distancing is still important. Uh, obviously, when we had to meet, change from two to one meters, we had lots of questions. Well, does that mean one meter is safe? Um, it is one meter plus. So one meter is not safe. Uh, you have to be mindful that just mild coughs, those droplets can travel six meters. Uh, one meter carries about uh, two to 10 times greater risk than standing two meters away from somebody. So the context really here is this was a compromise to help businesses survive who couldn't operate um, on this, with this two meter um, rule in place. Um, one meter plus mitigation. Well, for large droplets, uh, seating side to side or back to back as opposed to face to face is a simple measure. Having screens in place, so that's staff uh, wearing visors, that is uh, screens in between seating areas between different customers who have the cough, sneeze, those droplets don't uh, travel towards them and, and in and potentially infect that group at a different table. That's large droplets, and these are some examples here. Screens in between the table, so that's great. Um, this is a screen, uh, difficult to see here, but at the left you'll see a little table, that's actually the bar area, so staff will be huddling around there to collect drinks, maybe standing about for a minute or two. Um, and to the right is obviously tables. Now what they've done is, and this is also a corridor through to the back of the restaurant. So they've put up this screen to give customers that separation between the kind of corridor and seating area. So those are great for the large droplets um, that we talk about where those droplets fall quite quickly. But what about one meter plus mitigation for aerosols? That is very, very different. There, uh, the only way you can mitigate it is by really good ventilation and effective face coverings. So um, I'm still surprised by you know the amount of restaurants I'm going into where staff are not wearing face coverings. Uh, they're going uh, right up to table to serve customers. Um, you know the these rules are in place to to avoid outbreaks. Um, so it's quite concerning when I see these things. Um, now, obviously, effective face coverings, there's practical uh, limits there. Um, we can't wear face covering and eat and drink, uh, so there's limits. Uh, but you will see that, um, obviously, there's exemptions around this. But as much as possible, staff and customers should have face coverings on as much as they can to reduce that risk of uh, the droplets, the aerosols uh, coming out as they're talking, chatting, breathing out. Um, so. It, it doesn't say it yet, but uh, hopefully um, it, the, some advice will change in this area to the fact that customers dining should wear face covering up, to the, up until the point that the food is being served or the drinks have been served. Um, at the moment, it seems that the position is uh, just being taken that as soon as you walk into the restaurant, customers are taking coverings off. 
Now, whether that's a misinterpretation of the rules or simply the practicalities of how customers are generally behaving, um, but it's, it's clearly an area that uh, you know, needs improvement to avoid outbreaks and potential further closures. Um, other practical measures, let the sun in. So most of the virus can be killed off within seven minutes of sunlight. Windows, unfortunately, stop the virus killing UVC rays. Uh, so it's not just enough to open up the blinds and curtains. You need to open the windows to let the rays uh, come in. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we've had questions from businesses, will I buy UV light sterilizer? claims to kill 99% of the coronavirus. Um, UVC rays, yes, do kill the virus, but they also are really harmful to human skin. So if you see these products online, it's highly likely to be a scam. Um, they are working on a product which is uh, not harmful to humans and will kill off the virus, but that isn't uh, believed to be available to probably the pandemic's over. So that current technology isn't available. This is very different from things that you'll see in, I've seen them in hairdressers, a metal cabinet, which has a UV light um, and that um, sterilizes your combs, et cetera. Well, that is a closed off unit. Uh, people aren't putting their hands in there while it's, whilst it's on. So that is safe. That's very different from having some UV lights uh, on while people are walking around your premise. Um, indoor humidity, keeping that about 50, 60%. Generally speaking, um, we're quite uh, lucky in the UK. Um, indoor humidity ranges around the 35 to 40% range, 45% um, rather. Um, but you need to be mindful of all of this because as the colder weather comes, we will start putting indoor heating up. That can drop humidity uh, down very low. And what that means is rather than use droplets, uh, still retaining their moisture and dropping quickly to the surfaces, they dehydrate quicker and then they turn into these aerosol particles that float around for a while. Now, if you had amazing ventilation, you almost don't need to consider the humidity, but this is just one of the factors uh, of different things that you uh, should be mindful of going forward uh, as we approach, you know, winters uh, only, you know, three, four months away and we will have cold spells here and there, so be mindful. Uh, keeping noise levels to a minimum. So basically, as, when we talk louder, it releases a lot more virus particles than when we talk quietly. This is why the guidance says, you know, no sports broadcast, no loud music, because we ha then have to talk louder over uh, that noise. Um, appreciate it's really difficult. What does this mean in practice? You know, how long is too long to be near with somebody with a virus or too long to talk? Uh, loudly you know these are the kind of questions that we've been asked science is still you know there's no black and white answers at this point we won't have all the answers till the pandemic's over and we can uh, scientists can look over all the stats but what we know at the moment is and what's been um, premised by uh, doctors is that you probably need to breathe in a few hundred to a few thousand of the viruses to overwhelm an immune system um, and it, the only thing in terms of timing in the official guidance is the NHS track and trace program if they've got details of somebody that's had the virus they will try and trace everybody that's been around that person for 15 minutes or more um, uh, and within two meters so that's the that's the people they consider to be higher risk and worth testing um, this is one study that was done uh, where they get all this really fancy equipment in the lab. They look at the amount of particles that are released when people are talking quietly and loudly. And they estimated that just one minute of loud speaking could generate um, at least a thousand virus containing droplets. And this is why the advice is, you know, quiet conversation, limit idle chit chat as much as you can. I know this is not easy, Part of being in business is developing a relationship with your customers. Um, none of this is easy, but uh, perhaps to put your mind at rest, this is you know the consistent messaging that's coming out from local to national government, from your trade associations. Your whole industry is being told to operate in this way, um, and so it's you know customers, the public are quickly becoming 
used to the fact that things are very different and will be for a while. So keep that in mind when you're, you know, you're trying to implement these policies and, and remind customers in, in different ways to, um, you know, to do, to follow the advice um, that you're, you're providing. Okay, well, that's uh, quite a bit of context from me. We're now going to move on to Andrew Green, policy manager with the, the BBPA, uh, to have an industry perspective. Yeah, I, I can briefly run through the sort of information that, that we've developed, either ourselves or in collaboration with uh, other bodies like UK Hospitality. Um, it's all generally available on our website, the BBPA website, uh, but I believe Paul is going to be sending some uh, direct links uh, in the pack after this, but I'll try and run through some of the uh, the assets and information that is generally available to those that might find it useful to use. Um, starting with, we, we developed a, a, an FAQ uh, based on uh, questions that we were getting from our members on the government guidance, what it means, how it should be interpreted. Uh, we worked on that and developed that with UK Hospitality and also another organisation you may have heard of, the, the British Industry of Innkeeping, the BII. Uh, so both of those trade bodies also have useful information on their websites. Um, we have developed a couple of directories, one around uh, test and trace apps, uh, that we uh, put out uh, is available on our website. So obviously people will be aware there are a lot of people out there that have developed uh, individual apps for the contact tracing, collection of the customer details. So we've compiled those into a directory. We also produced uh, a briefing note in collaboration with UK Hospitality on the, the test and trace guidance, uh, the NHS test and trace guidance and how people can uh, collect customer details in a, in a secure fashion. Um, obviously there are a number of different methods by which people can do that, whether it's via, via an app that you use to order, via an app that uses a QR code. Uh, some some uh, pubs I've seen, they have a text number, you can text your details to. Others operate something very simple, such as a, a sheet of paper and a pen or a book. Uh, obviously, whichever one works best, uh, that is down to an individual business. Um, we are strongly recommending that, that people do this as a, as a means for uh, helping the NHS uh, system and also uh, minimising the chances of things like local lockdowns happening. Um, so we, we've, we've developed a briefing now in conjunction with UK Hospitality on that. That's available on our website. Another restart directory that we have um, has set out a number of different providers that have approached us. We've put them all together in one place. Uh, people that have developed food ordering apps, uh, contactless payment apps, uh, risk assessment apps. In particular, I'd highlight one. We've worked in collaboration with an organization called Safety Culture. They have a, uh, an app platform called iAuditor. We put a risk assessment on there that is based on the government guidance. Um, and it's free to sign up for for three months to use that to do your risk assessments if you haven't already done one or don't already have a process in place that you've been using. Um, within that restart directory, you also have people that provide various safety equipment, signage, etc. Lots of different providers of different uh, facilities to make your uh, venue COVID secure. Um, what else do we have? We have we have guidance uh, to help people with the issue of beer destruction. Uh, if you still haven't managed to do that yet, you've got until uh, the end of this month before the, the water authorities start to reimpose the charges that they had in place previously before we negotiated a relaxation of that. So uh, hopefully most people will have done that by now if they're going to do it. Uh, but we also have a, a website that we set up to give you guidance on that and to ensure that you are liaising with your, your beer providers. Uh, that's uh, returnyourbeer.co.uk. But again, Paul will, will include the details of this afterwards. Um, anything else I need to touch on? Uh, we've got various bits of information also related to COVID. Um, how you register for the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. We've got links to that. We've got links to, uh, Paul mentioned earlier, the Business and Planning Act, which came into force last week, I think. Uh, the one that allows you to have these new temporary pavement licenses and the act that has extended the uh, uh, licensing for off sales to uh, all licensed premises. Um, I think that's all I needed to touch on. Um, 
The only other scheme to maybe mention, um, it's a useful accreditation scheme for those that want to take it on because it obviously promotes your business as being uh, COVID secure. Uh, Visit Britain have a campaign called uh, We're Good To Go accreditation scheme. It's uh, again, you just have to demonstrate that you've done your risk assessment as Paul highlighted earlier. That is that is the vital part of all of this. Highlight you've done your risk assessment uh, and they will uh, register you under that accreditation scheme, which is searchable by any customers that want to check that a venue has has taken the necessary steps to ensure that it's COVID secure. Um, Paul, was there anything else you wanted uh, to me to touch yeah, on? Yeah, no, that's excellent. Because uh, as, uh, as you say, said there, we're going to circulate all the links. Um, so there's some really good information out there. But I thought it was really important to give you a flavour that there's uh, lots of useful information on on a BPPA's website um, that will help you out. Okay, thanks for that. Now, we're getting lots of questions about face coverings, visors, so let me um, share some information around that. You'll be thinking about this in terms of supplies for your staff, policies for your customers, or your own face coverings that you're buying as a citizen. So, um, face visors, first of all, these must extend below the chin, wrap around the face if they're to be effective. But those face visors, shields come with limits. Uh, whilst they're great in terms of being able to see faces, facial expressions, they don't, uh, whilst they, they will stop large droplets that come from sneezes, coughs, and give protection to the wearer and those around them for that, um, they don't stop staff breathing in the aerosols that are floating around the air. And when staff are talking, breathing out, if you haven't got a face covering as well, it, the aerosols that they release um, are just floating around and, and being breathed in from the customers that are around them. So by themselves, they are limited. Um, PP masks, see these are the ones typically with the filters on, like your KN95, FFP1. Uh, do be aware there's some face coverings uh, which you've also started including a filter. Face coverings are not tested to a standard so uh, don't be fooled that something that looks like a filter means it's uh, particularly effective. Um, it's not a guarantee, they might be effective but that's not a guarantee when it comes to face coverings. PPE have been tested in labs, they've been shown to protect the wearer anywhere between 90 to 98 percent um, from virus particles there is a shortage of these which is why you know you should, we should only be saving those for those in the highest risk jobs like your doctors etc face coverings are not pp they're not, there is no standard to test them against um, the effectiveness varies significantly so there's been multiple tests around the world in labs you can get homemade shop bought face coverings and they vary in their effectiveness between 18 to 95 percent. So that's in terms of how good they are at protecting others from somebody who has the virus who wears one. Um, with this in mind, be aware of fashion brands. You know they're often more bling than filtering. Um, so lots of brand names have now started doing their own face masks. Just because it's got a brand name attached, that isn't. Uh, necessarily a sign that it is effective. Um, really, it's, it comes down to number of layers and materials, fabric being used, whether something's effective or not. That all said, some homemade face coverings stitched at home uh, by someone have been found to be more effective than some shop purchased ones. Um, uh, and that even compared in, in contrast with surgical masks some face coverings were found to be much more effective than the surgical masks, the, these disposable ones that are quite popular with the public. So uh, one of these studies I thought was really good because it shows visually what we're trying to get across here. So this is an example of just two of the many masks that have been tested. The one at the top is handkerchief doubled over um, and you'll see when somebody coughs uh, you've got leakage at the top and there's a lot of leakage through the mask at the front. Uh, you compare that with this 100% cotton double layer uh, stitch covering below and you'll see whilst there's leakage at the top uh, and this is because they haven't got the 
the nose clip, they give a really good fit. Um, there's hardly any leakage in front of the mask. So that offers a good level of protection to people that are standing in front and around that person. Now, I can't get into all the fabrics and all the test results here in the webinar, but in the follow-up information, you'll get some details of face coverings to buy and those to avoid. Um, the key thing to also point out here that's uh, kind of changed um, is, you know, we've been used to hearing that face coverings are about protecting others, not the wearer. Um, but a study in July looked at face covering use in hospitals from around the world, and they found that those wearing coverings uh, were less likely to uh, pick up the virus. So it does seem that face coverings offer an, a level of protection also to the wearer. There's policies, you know, rules, laws around customers wearing face coverings. Um, there were some exemptions. Some of those have been changed, removed uh, in 8th of August. Um, whatever the current legal requirements are for customers and face coverings, you can obviously have company policies that go over and above that. Uh, so when we were advised in the close contact sector um, at that time, customers going into barbers, masseuse, didn't have to wear face coverings and um, you know we said well based upon science that we know now um, we recommend you do uh, have that as a company policy um, and you know here we are um, six eight weeks later and, and the rules have caught up so one of the things to kind of highlight here is that you know with the best world in the world and no government guidance will ever be as uh, up to date as the science. It will always be uh, you know, a few steps behind because it takes time from something, uh, scientists knowing something in a lab, publishing a paper, it going up to who, being digested, going back down to country, um, administrations to be considered, and then guidance created. So be mindful of the science that you've heard in terms of policies that you implement. Um, your trade association will hopefully keep you up to date as the science evolves. Um, don't wait uh, for some official guidance to tell you to implement a measure that you think um, will help keep your staff and customers safe. Um, unless you have excellent ventilation inside your premise, you know, staff should really be wearing face coverings. Um, there will be parts in your property that are a lot less ventilated than others. That might be kitchens. Um, it might be in hotels, it's going to be corridors. So uh, one hotel I looked at, you've got a long corridor, 10 plus rooms off of that corridor, fire door at the start, fire door at the end of that corridor, no windows and doors, no ventilation, fresh air coming into that, that space. Now, when they do housekeeping at the end of a week, when multiple rooms are being vacated, they're cleaning three, five, six rooms all on that uh, coming off of that one corridor and unfortunately these rooms all had child safety catches on the windows which really restricted how much the window could open so it took it will take a very long time for those rooms to be easily ventilated and um, the staff were not properly ventilating the corridors at that time they simply put a small bin or bag um, to keep the door ajar. So um, whilst the room is getting ventilated to some extent, uh, and it's questionable how much because of the, the door, the window catches, the corridor isn't getting ventilated at all. Um, and so those corridors are, um, you know, real risk in terms of breathing out constantly from customers over days, weeks, um, your staff, Bear in mind what I've said on the, the research around the tiny aerosols, they can linger in the air for hours and days. So you need to think, how do you ventilate those areas? Yes, there's a need for fire doors and to keep people safe, but you need to think about how you ventilate those, those areas, whether it's staff monitoring uh, that area, keeping fire doors open to allow a rush of you know, suddenly open all doors, windows, connect to that corridor. It's your building, um, you'll know best how to do it, um, but uh, give that some, some consideration. Um, 
the housekeepers in this particular hotel, none of them were wearing face coverings. So that's, you know, that's a, a particular no-no when they're in that, they're going through and working for a long period of time in those unventilated areas. Let's talk about customers now. There are some customers that are exempt. Um, people will know that to uh, some extent or another. There'll be, if you're not a customer that's exempt, you only have a vague awareness that, uh, that about those exemptions. They're, you know, they're not relevant um, in your life. Be mindful of that. Um, those people who are exempt from wearing face coverings will be turning up in communal areas of hotels. Uh, where everybody else will have face coverings on. It will not be obvious to anybody looking at them why they're not wearing it. Um, they will not be mindful or, or necessarily aware that they're, they're exempt. So how do we deal with that? Because that can cause friction. Uh, you may be aware there has been some arguments. Uh, some have come to blows in, in the public transport sector uh, where customers haven't worn, worn face coverings. So there's a need to communicate that. There's a need for advanced information to everybody turning up at your premise. Um, if you know a customer is coming who's going to be exempt, um, how is that easy to communicate to those around them? Now, this is just you know off the kind of top of my head idea, and it's something you guys need to think about and talk about in your industries. But um, Something that came to mind when I was thinking about that problem is on um, London tubes. Um, there's uh, obviously there's a need for people to give up their chairs uh, to pregnant people, elderly people. Now, pregnant uh, uh, women, you cannot see that they're pregnant for several months into pregnancy, um, and and yet they're you know they have a need to to sit down. They don't feel comfortable asking the question. TfL came up with these badges that they wear saying. You know, I'm pregnant, please give up your seat. Uh, and it's just a nice, simple measure that lets uh, that person communicate to the world that they have, uh, you know, a, a greater need for that seat. And that's maybe something that can be considered in this uh, area. You know, the face coverings are going to be around for many, many months. Um, is it helpful um, to uh, have stickers that say I'm exempt from wearing a face covering? Would that be an easy, simple way to communicate that to others around them? It's something that, that needs to be thought about. Um, talk to your trade associations. Maybe they've got some other ideas around that. Because what you don't want is customers who are wearing face coverings to think, well, he's not wearing it, so I'm going to take off mine, and that'll cause uh, disagreements. Um, and you also don't want the person who are wearing face coverings to walk away, uh, to leave your premise and think, actually, that hotel, that pub, whatever it may be, wasn't dealing with that person um, uh, not wearing a face covering. I'm, I'm not feeling safe. I'm going to write negative reviews. Or I'm not going to go back. So um, there's a real kind of economic uh, as well as social need to, to consider this. Gloves, I'll just mention this because it's maybe less relevant to elements of hospitality, but general advice from gloves is if you didn't need them before, so for example, those uh, hand and chemicals, bleach, uh, should be wearing gloves to keep their, themselves safe. But other than that, if you didn't need gloves before, they're really for medical settings where you're coming into contact with blood, body fluids. The advice is frequent hand washing, generally. That's a lot safer because we're human, um, we touch our face subconsciously 23 times an hour. Um, so we might land up touching surfaces that have the virus, touching our face, thinking our hands are clean, that gloves are clean, and, and we suddenly we, we've got the virus um, because of that. Um, the, um, this may be relevant to hotels who are doing massage um, because there was questions around that. There was different guidance on whether or not to wear gloves. Please go to our close contact sector webinar where we dive into that a lot more detail with um, our perspective and also industry experts' perspective. Um, the only other thing I see on this front is PHE advice um, in, in terms of skin to skin contact was that sweat secretions isn't known to be a transmission uh, risk. Uh, so, if both people had clean hands, shaked hands, for example, there isn't a risk even if the other person was sweating. 
that has uh, obviously ramifications in terms of if you're doing massage uh, to people. But look at our other webinar for that where we're getting to that in a bit more detail. Um, now, over to Richard Clifford, the Policy Manager at UK Hospitality, who can uh, let us know what they've been doing in this area. Yeah, thanks Paul and good morning everyone. Uh, thank you Andy there as well. So obviously as Andy mentioned, we've been working quite closely in conjunction with uh, the British Bureau and Pub Association and a number of other organisations in terms of putting guidance for the industry. So just quickly for those of you who may not have heard of UK Hospitality, UK is a trade association the voice of a sector that generates over 130 billion in revenue each year. We've got over 700 member companies which operate in 65,000 venues across the country. And we represent businesses from pubs to bars to restaurants, hotels, hostels, uh, contract catering, basically the whole commute of the hospitality sector. In terms of what I'm going to discuss today, I've been asked to look specifically at accommodation, so hotels, briefly looking at the government guidelines for accommodation providers as well as the UKH guidelines which we've developed with industry partners ahead of reopening. Um, obviously Andrew's gone through quite a lot of the work that the UK has done in terms of producing guidelines and guidance uh, for their members. Uh, UK Hospitality's got the same, a number of different um, bits of guidance on our website as well which are available, um, which I'm sure Paul will be sending out after this uh, call itself. So there's a lot of information that we've been gathering, working with partners and working with government to provide for businesses across the hospitality sector ahead of reopening. So if you touch upon accommodation, looking at government guidelines and our guidance, and then I'm going to touch a little bit upon hospitality as well. So that's looking at businesses such as the events industry and bowling alleys, which have now obviously been given a date to reopen, and then also look at nightclubs um, and businesses like that, which of course haven't yet been told they're able to reopen, but hopefully we will be pushing government to expedite this as soon as it's possible and as soon as it's safe for, uh, for that to happen. So in terms of looking at accommodation, uh, a UK age member survey ahead of the 4th of July uh, looked at businesses and accommodation businesses that were able to reopen. We found that 8% could be operating through lockdown, predominantly hosting um, the NHS workers and key workers across the UK. 46% were planning on opening within a few days of the 4th of July, with 20% looking at operating later in July. So you had 15% looking to reopen in August, 9% in September, and 2% in October or later. So what this basically means is right now we're still looking at about 25 to 30% of the accommodation sector that are not open and that will be reopening over the course of the next few months. That said, obviously the government guidance for reopening is still relevant to businesses that have already dipped their toe in and reopened following uh, July 4th. It's obviously very important for businesses to continue to monitor the execution of their own business activities in terms of enforcing government regulations and also looking at ways in which they're able to sustain this change, monitoring feedback from customers, communicating with employees and allocating proper resources to make sure that their businesses are COVID safe. Why is it imperative to do this? So a recent bit of work that we did alongside the all-party parliamentary group for hospitality and tourism, which is a informal grouping of MPs. Uh, they recently produced a report to recovery. Uh, what this report found, or a submission to this report, basically said that 60% of over 1,000 consumers that had been surveyed said that they preferred clean and safe venues as opposed to a return to normal. So it's imperative that businesses take these steps, take these pragmatic steps to try and achieve. Uh, a safe um, a safe environment and one that they can show consumers that they are obviously taking necessary precautions and necessary steps to protect them and also make sure that they are COVID secure. The government guidance on accommodation reopening is pragmatic, that's obviously very good. There's some leeway for uh, common sense implementation which should obviously help businesses as well. Paul touched upon various things as well in terms of payment licenses and various steps that the government have taken. I think that there has been a general concern for businesses and the industry and actually making sure that these things are functioning and able to help businesses as opposed to being red tape and hindering them or reopening. The government guidance, this is what you'll need to look at if you're an accommodation business and this is what you'll need to do your risk assessment on, hospitality guidance, which I'll speak about in a few moments. That's more uh, of a list of options that you may wish to take in terms of making your menu secure. So the government guidance you'll see on the website is very it's a very good website to have um, the risk assessment template from the health and safety executive present there, as Paul mentioned. 
it's all available um, with the imperative steps that you need to take in terms of protecting your workforce and protecting your customers. So increasing the frequency of hand washing, making reasonable efforts to allow workers to work from home, although that's going to change on the 1st of August, and also implementing social distancing measures of two meters or one meters with mitigation, uh, also including uh, things like space barriers, et cetera, as well. There are various different options that businesses can implement to be COVID secure. So that's all available on their website. In terms of the UK hospitality uh, guidance that we produced, it was developed to support the reopening of hotels and accommodation providers to do so in a safe manner. Um, and it set out potential steps that businesses may wish to take um, to mitigate the risks. So there's a lot of industry engagement that went on here with the development of these um, these guidelines and obviously we've done them across various different uh, aspects of hospitality including obviously with pubs uh, alongside the BBPA. So just going to quickly touch upon a few of the key issues that accommodation providers may wish to implement in terms of uh, reopening if they haven't already done so. So things such as the registration system, we have a track and trace, or like the UK, do we have a track and trace system uh, or briefing on our website and the government has called for this system to implemented um, and then this requires businesses or you know, businesses are asked to keep a temporary record of customers that go through their doors for 21 days. UK guidance is focused heavily on hygiene. I found it uh, quite bizarre actually that um, in 30 minutes apparently you touch 300 surfaces uh, or the average human touches 300 surfaces so there's obviously a lot of hand contact around hospitality venues so good hand washing and um, hygiene measures are obviously key, so that's promoted within the guidance that we've produced. And that obviously, when you look at hotels and accommodation sectors, that includes heightened cleaning and disinfection of various areas, including the rooms themselves. In terms of staff protection, you'll want to uh, stagger breaks of staff to ensure they're able to socially distance from one another, disinfect office areas, socially distance staff, and also make sure that their kit and their uh, uniforms are washed correctly. Training measures are obviously important as well. So staff need to be briefed and trained, RE social distancing measures. Something that Paul mentioned, which I think we obviously wholeheartedly agree with as well, is that you need to continue to engage with your staff throughout this process as well, as they're very much on the front line there. They are the ones who are customer facing, and they are the ones who are responsible for you know, um, implementing these uh, social distancing or various different uh, regimes throughout the course of reopening. So it's very important to continue to engage with your staff and make sure they're well trained and aware Obviously, as you get through to the sustaining the change and making sure that this continues to be implemented in the long run, you're going to need to refresh people's memories because standards will presumably stop and everyone is human. And, you know, as things become you know, more normalized, people may begin to slip. And it's important to remember that staff and those that work in the business are those facing the customers. And they are the ones who are obviously going to be, you know, customer may just walk past and see it once, but one bad review or, you know, one slip up can potentially affect that business view. It's important to ensure that training and signs and shared areas are all um, advertised with uh, proper um, signage to ensure that customers feel safe and feel able to, to go about their business and obviously feel yeah, secure within the environment. Um, there's obviously, including, I'll, I'll wrap up fairly quickly with the accommodation stuff now, we have uh, advice for businesses in terms of housekeeping, in terms of how to disinfect rooms. Um, one of the frequently asked questions that we keep getting is if there's someone who's immobile, can't leave the room, are they able to stay there while well, housekeeping appears? The answer is yes, uh, provided it's socially distanced. Another frequently asked question we often get um, is what happens in a hotel if there's a suspected case of COVID-19 in your business? How do you get them to self-isolate? Are they able to uh, stay within the accommodation? What happens if they stay within the accommodation? So just to touch upon that. If someone is, uh, or if you do have a COVID case in your business, there are pretty detailed uh, guidelines on the government website for how to do that. You should, you know, they should obviously inform the accommodation provider that they'll request a test. If reasonable, they should be able to provide public transport. They should be able to use sort of private transports to leave. But um, if obviously they can't reasonably leave, then it has to be discussed with the relevant health authority and also local authorities as well. So all this available um, on the UKH website, along with our guidance notes on various different industries. So it's all present there, and Paul obviously we're selling out quite a lot of that after the uh, webinar itself. Um, in terms of forgotten hospitality, as I mentioned, all this first events and various industries like building alleys and stuff will be reopening again. Uh, we have guidance and guidelines for businesses that operate in those areas. Uh, obviously, the maximum 
uh, number of people that will be allowed at events is 30 for the time being. Um, I'm not entirely sure if that's going to change anytime soon, I would assume not. But this is obviously going to then impact accommodation providers who may use their menus for uh, events or conferences and the like. Um, but we continue to work with government uh, to expedite the, yeah, the successful opening of these businesses as quickly as possible. So I'll close that there and if, unless anyone has any questions or I don't think there's any else that I've uh, not touched on there. It's all back to you. Okay, let's talk about bringing customers back. Now, before I talk about this in regards to hospitality generally, you know, we have, you know, there are some sectors that are still shut down, still perceived uh, to be higher risk. Uh, and therefore they're not allowed to open, likes of nightclubs, concerts, music events. Um, this is really tough for that whole industry, but I just want to give uh, a, a, an example of some work they've been doing to try and help customers come back to their premises uh, and reopen more quickly. So the electronic da dance music industry um, felt that they were being left behind, they weren't being uh, considered, included in the various government support uh, schemes. Um, not when compared to more traditional dance, like your, your ballet tap, for example. Uh, and so uh, several international DJs, along with the likes of Nighttime Industries Association, um, set up this Let Us Dance campaign, where essentially they encourage customers of that industry, uh, talk to your MPs, write to MPs, get on social media, um, and, and it worked. Um, they got um, uh, government um, made it clear that that industry uh, can also access the 500 million culture recovery fund. Um, now, if you haven't already, please register for this if it's uh, relevant to you. Um, 1st of September is a deadline to register. Um, you don't need to have in mind the amount that you want to claim at this point. But that is a registration deadline. There's then other deadlines to get your applications in, and and funding, you know, is is available anywhere from fifty thousand up to I think it was a million pounds. So quite you know significant financial support available. Go to Arts Council website for all the details to register and apply, and uh, you can also look at the NTIA uh, website with some advice there. Any problems queries, contact Arts Council. If you've still got queries problems, uh, go back to your trade association. You can possibly raise those on your behalf. Okay, so hopefully that, that sectors are going to reopen soon uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a safe way. Uh, so that, you know, there's plenty of customers. It's a big industry. Lots of people can't wait to get out and dance and, and you know experience that, have some fun. So I'm, I'm hoping that's going to, um, they're going to have some positive news soon on that front. Now, for the rest of hospitality industry, you've done your risk assessment, you've done everything to keep people safe. But that is just the first step, isn't it? About a third of consumers uh, uh, have this fear of going back into indoor premises. Lots of surveys out there, they've done them for shops, for pubs, but it's pretty much the same. About 30 to 40% uh, of people are not comfortable going back in. So you need to work hard to counter that fear. Several things you can do. Uh, easiest step is um, fill in the government COVID secure notice. So do what's necessary for that and, and publish it, um, not publish it, but stick it up in your premise windows. This is a coffee shop that's got it in their window. Um, but think about this. It shouldn't just be a tick box exercise that I have to put it in my window somewhere. Um, they've stuck it at the bottom of the window. It's very difficult for somebody just passing by to easily spot that. So you might have, some of your uh, business might be uh, passing custom, yeah? And those will just be looking at the premise. Uh, if it doesn't jump out at them um, that you're COVID secure, that might put them off coming in. Now for most businesses um, and, and most consumers, they, before they even step out their door, uh, sorry, this is one other example of the point I want to make here. Um, so this guy has got two notices, one either side of a serving counter. So, you know, he thinks he's doing everything he can to get this message across. But if you're just walking past, that's easily lost uh, amongst the, these big, you know, banners, this big green banner. Um, so there's nothing to stop you going big uh, with that message. You know, have banners, have whatever's relevant to your premise to get across that message to passers-by, 
and those that are, are, are approaching your business that you are COVID secure. Now, as I was about to say, uh, most people will go online before they get anywhere near physical premise. Um, they will go to your website to make a decision where they're eating out, which club they're going to, which theater, which, you know, even if they like to book in person, they will have done a research online. So you need to get clear messaging on your homepage that you are safe, that you're open, that you're safe. Um, right at the top of the homepage, information on there or link to the relevant page to summarize what you're doing to keep the people safe. Consider a third party uh, views, um, uh, authority views on what you've done. Um, publish a risk assessment. I know most people will not want to read it, but there's still going to be some customers who aren't convinced by your little COVID secure notice, um, aren't convinced by a few paragraphs saying you've done certain things to keep them safe. But if you've got your 30 page risk assessment document personalized to your business, talks through stage by stage what you've done to keep staff and customers safe. There's no way that they will um, be left in any doubt that you've uh, done everything you can reasonable uh, to look out for them. So get it up on your website and link to it in your marketing materials, on your tables, in your premises. So that's one thing. And when you've implemented all these new processes, please test them. Uh, you know, talk, ideally your customers are your best uh, testers because they don't know your processes or your website inside and out. And whilst you can get staff and yourself to test these, it's never going to be the same. Uh, just two examples here, went to a restaurant a few weeks ago. Uh, it had a basement um, level. We were in there. Uh, wasn't happy, but the wife booked it, so I wasn't going to argue with that. Um, but I'm sitting there in this basement, no windows to, to get fresh air in. They've got an aircon unit uh, and they've got vents. And I, I go to their web page, which is talking about their, their new cleaning regime, um, but there's nothing on there about ventilation. And minutes are ticking by and I'm getting more and more concerned. And... Um, for some people will not some people will just walk out if they've got a safety concern they will just walk away and you might not get them back some uh, i think a lesser extent of customers will ask staff um, but here's the thing um, i've uh, went in uh, as, a, as a customer uh, talking to pubs hotels restaurants and when i've asked those questions to staff um, um, I've got either blank looks or more often than not, the response has been, well, um, yeah, government wouldn't uh, let us open unless we were safe. Yeah? So I don't expect all your staff to know how to answer those questions. They don't all, they don't all need to know how your ventilation works and whether it's recirculating air or, or fresh air supply, but you have to train them to know how to deal with those queries. So. Make sure that somebody in your premise does know about the various measures you've implemented and that staff are uh, trained to direct those queries to the right person. So that customer gets the uh, reassurance they need uh, because if they don't, um, you know, you risk losing them and also you risk them going online uh, and, and making negative feedback or passing that on to their friends, family. So, um, make sure you're communicating those processes in the right way. And this, is, this emphasizes the need to have all this information on your website because staff then can simply say, uh, look, any query you have about anything, um, just look at this link here, which is on, uh, you know, on display at your table in the, um, in the premise. So the customer can just look at that information and get all the detail himself. Um, try, not everybody feels comfortable making, um, leaving feedback, raising these concerns. So uh, look at how you incentivize feedback, negative feedback from customers, from staff as well. Not all of them will want to raise concerns with managers. Um, perhaps think about a, not, a way to anonymize feedback from customers and staff to encourage it to come forward. Um, in terms of reassuring uh, customers that it's safe to come in, um, think about a virtual tour, you know, a video where you walk through how they queue, how they enter, 
how they experience a service, the waitings area, how they're served uh, when they're in there, how they exit. So that is probably the best that you're going to get uh, before anybody walks into your premise um, in, in terms of putting across what the new experience is going to be like when they come. Now, not all of these things are easy. There's pra um, practical difficulties. There's a cost attached to these. You may be having to make some tough decisions. Do you buy safety measure A, which is more expensive, versus safety measure B, which is cheaper, but you know to be less uh, effective? Uh, and the things, two things to keep in mind here is one, this is a long term. Um, people that talk about there might be two to six different waves of and spikes. Um, the general consensus seems to be that this is going to be around for about a year, though nobody knows for sure. Even when COVID-19 goes, uh, we're living in a globalized world. There's epidemics happening that I mean, the health officials tell us that epidemics, pandemics are more likely in the future because of the way that we're, we're living. Um, and so whilst these might occur in other areas, countries, regions, people are flying all the time. Uh, and so there's a risk that we will see something like this in two, three, four years. So whatever you buy today is something you're going to use for a long time and you may be able to bring it back in. Those, for example, safety screens or, or better air con, uh, HEPA air conditioning units. It's something that you can uh, be making use of further down the line. Now, all these things come with a cost. Um, businesses, uh, you know, many of them were fearful about increasing prices. Um, but what seems to be what we've seen generally across many sectors is this kind of 5% COVID-19 supplement. So in terms of the amount that's been increased, 5% is terms tends to be the uh, atypical. And the key thing here is messaging, you know, and tell customers why there's been a price increase. Everybody knows what's happening. Most people will understand the need um, for you to cover your costs, to implement screen, PPE, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a range of financial support available. It can be a bit of a minefield. So go to this uh, web page here, fill in a few answers to some questions and you'll get information on the support that's uh, relevant to your sector. Other than financial support, there's also a new free government recovery advice package um, that will give you free or cheaper access to certain things like accounting, advertising advice. Do you also look at your trade association reopening guide? Because many of them that I've seen for different sectors uh, get into things like marketing advice and or give you access, cheaper access to um, people who can give you uh, advice around marketing. Um, my only comment uh, on this is as somebody that kind of lives and breathes e-commerce e um, is in terms of social media, um, you know, people want, uh, don't just want to hear about promotions or whether you're open, closed. People with social media, people like to get an insight into the business. Who's running it? What they're about? Um, you know, everybody's aware of this pandemic. This is an opportunity to tell a bit of a story. You know, what have you been doing? What's your business been doing the two, three months you were closed? And um, and and kind of connect that, that story with, you um, the new safety measures that you've implemented to now change your premise and keep it uh, safe for them. Now, obviously, nobody wants to uh, have a second shutdown or a local lockdowns. So there's two things you can do to prevent that from happening. One, keep yourself COVID secure. Uh, and two, report those bad apples in your industry who aren't implementing safety measures. You can do that by contacting the HSD helpline or your local authority uh, environment health department. Um, I'll just stress again, you know, some of you will be uncomfortable about reporting competitors, knowing that they're going through a you know, really financial uh, hard time. Um, but let me just put your mind at rest. Well, two things I can say on this. One is every regulator has an advice focus approach where there's a statutory code, regulators code that says you have to have a proportionate advice focus approach. And that's certainly what we've been doing when we had reports of barbers being open when they were supposed to be closed. 
um, we, we went and advised them. We talked to them verbally, we talked to, to them about the reasoning. Um, and when that didn't work, letters, and, and then eventually for the minority that still refused to listen to the advice, uh, we issued fines. But it is really a staged approach. You know, we're here 110% uh, regulators, please, we're here to support businesses get this right. So that's one thing. Second thing is, if you don't uh, do your bit by reporting the bad apples in your sector, um, those bad apples will be the ones that have outbreaks uh, and those will get reported. And, um, you know, government, uh, if government sees lots of outbreaks happening in pub sector, hotel sector, um, there may be sector specific shutdowns. So it's in your own financial interest to help us uh, help your sector stay open, stay safe by making us aware of these, uh, these businesses. Because we're the best world in the world, we can't get around to every single business. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and even if we did, um, those businesses can obviously change their processes and measures from week to week. So um, please do let us know. Um, now, that's uh, a lot from, from us, RSP and uh, from our industry experts. We're now opening up to questions to any of the speakers. Please put these in the chat or just raise your hand um, uh, using the, the little button in Zoom to, to get our attention. Uh, whilst you're thinking of your questions, uh, let's, I just want to remind uh, everybody listening that we, the Regulatory Services Partnership um, serve the London boroughs of Richmond upon Thames, Wandsworth and Martin. Um, we are providing free, uh, more detailed guidance advice to our local businesses. Uh, in terms of COVID compliance. Unfortunately, we're not in a position to be able to do that for every other business outside our area, um, but we um, are also um, providing advice to non-local businesses on a cost recovery basis. So um, what that basically means is that we don't profit from that advice. Uh, so you can get your advice anywhere you want. You can go to uh, you know, health and safety uh, consultants um but you know we don't profit so most of the time you would find that we are significantly cheaper uh, than others out there uh, and secondly um the benefit of coming to the regulators is you know in terms of uh, advising you what measures are necessary to avoid risk and avoid enforcement action um the regulators are in the best position to do that because we know what typical regulators expect um, from businesses because that is what we're doing day in day out um, and so there has been uh, several instances of um, uh, health and safety consultants telling businesses to do really kind of go over uh, or do overkill when it comes to health and safety implementing measures that really were not expected by the local authority um, because they thought if you do x y and z you know, you're definitely going to be keeping safe and, and they wanted that insurance himself as a consultant that their client wouldn't be uh, have enforcement action against them and, and that would have repercussions, obviously, uh, for them doing business with them. Um, regulators have, uh, you know, uh, uh, an informed approach and we uh, look at what's reasonable and proportionate for your sector, your business, and the risks attached to your particular premise. Okay, so um, with all that said, uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us uh, today. I hope you find that helpful to help you continue trading safely or help you work towards reopening safely. Um, and now we're gonna open it up to uh, our panel for uh, any questions. Hello. Hello. Hi, um, it's Juliana in Putney here. We've just recently placed um, a table with two chairs outside. Now, <clears throat> do we still need to take people's details if they want to sit down and have a coffee? I know we're doing it for food. Um, do we do it if they want to sit down and have a coffee? Okay, so what, um, what the government guidance says is um, where anybody is... Um, um, having food or drink that isn't takeaway. So okay. 
even if it's just a, a, a coffee and they're and sitting down outdoors, if they're sitting around anywhere, um, you should be looking to take their details. The reasoning is, is because uh, time. With the virus, the longer you're around somebody that has the virus, the greater the risk of picking it up from them. Uh, so as you, uh, if you can imagine, they're sitting outside there, um, you know, you might have a table next to it, somebody with a virus, or even the even the person they've met up for the coffee, uh, you know, may have it. A friend, a colleague, uh, you know, work person. You haven't got a screen in between, you know, if it's outdoors. So uh, that's the reasoning. It's it's so they can track everybody that's been um, sitting around near somebody for 15 minutes or more. That's why takeaways wasn't thought to be um, necessary to include in that. Okay, and also, because we also do a takeaway, um, my understanding is to do to come in for a takeaway, they don't have to wear a mask. Is that correct? Obviously, um, no, if they take away, they have to wear a mask. If they sit in, they don't have to wear a mask or sit outside. No. So if they're ordering and they come in, then yeah. they need to wear a mask. If they're eating in or taken away, that's my question. So if they're eating in or taken, so there is exemption from the face covering rule. I'm, I'm happy for um, Andrew or Richard to chip in here. Um, face cover rule, there's exemptions which covers when you're eating um, at, a, at a premise because oh, naturally you can't do both at the same time. Um, <laughs> True. However, just think about what I've said around uh, face uh, coverings. Now, if somebody's coming for a takeaway, you should ideally be making them wait outdoors where it's safest. Now, uh, a personal experience of a takeaway the other month, I ordered over the phone. I was supposed to just go in, pick it up, but the restaurant chose not to cook the fish. They wanted to wait to see if I, you know, turned up. So I was sitting there for 20 minutes uh, waiting to collect it. So you need to have a policy. So there's one thing that's the law. There's another thing about a policy that is that works for you. So if you had a policy where uh, some of the orders by phone or, or uh, internet, but you don't cook until they turn up, that may change whether you ask them to uh, come and, and wait uh, inside with a face covering. But the, the most important thing here is get them waiting outdoors, limit waiting, limit the amount of time that they need to, you need to interact with them as much as possible. Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to chip in there, I don't think if they're, they're just turning up for takeaway, <clears throat> I, I don't think the rules require it. Um, it's not especially here, Paul. I mean, so we've, we've recently um, got a brief, I think we have a briefing on our website now um, about um, the new regulations that were brought in in terms of masks at the back end of last week and they were implemented on the Friday. It's not especially clear. I think my read of it was that if you are going in to sit down, so I think that was the, the question to you, was if you're going to sit down, do you have to wear a mask? Is that right? Or would you have to wear a mask on order? Um, I think it's you can remove the mask when you sit down within a premises, uh, but prior to that, whilst ordering, I think it's advised that you, uh, or indeed, I think it's the rule now that you should be wearing a mask. Um, there's a more detailed note though on that, uh, which is on the UK website, which we'll have to see right afterwards. Now, okay. and just just to, to, to example more what I've said about, you know, uh, some things are law and other things are, are recommendations. So I did one of these with a the close contact sector. Their sector, if you're a customer, you're walking into a barber, you're going for a massage, you as a customer aren't required to wear a face covering legally. However, knowing everything we know now about the latest science, I was recommended to that industry that they should uh, think about a policy of requiring all of the customers to wear a face covering. And, and you will see in many salons, that's exactly what they do. Um, they are trying to get ahead of this and trying to minimize the risk from the customer, who might be one of these 80% of people with the virus, not any symptoms, sharing that with their staff and other customers as they're breathing out. Uh, and uh, obviously in that context, you're in a, a salon from 30, 60 minutes plus. So, um, just be mindful in all of this that um, official guidance is always going to be playing catch up with the science.
because it takes a long time from us, you know, the, the latest science studies to go up to the likes of World Health Organization for them to digest it, have their own position that then gets cascaded to governments internationally. They need to digest it and then talk to trade associations and create guidance. So that there will always be a lag in the official position um, uh, as opposed to what the latest scientific uh, information is out there. Hi, hello. Um, this is Paula from The Flag. Um, hi. Can I, hi, can I ask a question? I've been asked to do a funeral. Um, we, before COVID, we did many, well, quite a few of them, and I would do a buffet. Now, what can we do? They've asked me, I said, I can't do a buffet, but they want me to do food. Has anyone got any ideas what I can do in that situation? For this funeral, it's for 15 to 20 people. They're going to be outside, but I'm not sure what to do about the food situation. So I've told them up to now I can't do it because normally I do a buffet. I mean, I've got loads of things that, you know, I've got complete in closed things, but what is the kind of law and can anyone give me an advice so I can do something for them? Ravina, Ravina yeah. do you want to maybe pick up that? Yeah, so as, you, as you've just said, like, you, you wouldn't be able to do a buffet. No. People, different people holding the utensils and things. No, no. Yeah. Recommend is just a sit down meal then. So I can't really do a sit down meal because we're, we're a pub that doesn't really do food. We only do it for, you know, if we were doing a buffet or something. Yeah. Some to me, because what I have, I've bought, um, they're like really big containers with, uh, you know, like you'd get in Marks and Spencers if you were buying sandwiches and they come in those containers that are covered oh, yeah. completely. Someone said to me, I, but I don't know if I can do this or not kind of do finger foods within that, put people on tables and then put one on each of the particular tables. It, would that kind of work or not? Um, well, you, what I'd say then, if you, if you get people to sit down, if you just make like yeah. a little pack for them and it, for each individual person, they can have a sandwich in there and a sausage roll or whatever you provide. And then they just, they just eat from that really. Um, if you can contact the whoever's organising funeral beforehand and just get people to send you details of what they prefer then you can put that in a pack for them and then they can just be given their individual do that kind of family because they're like family yeah, you, can, you can do it for like a household can share a platter yeah. say but nothing outside of the household should be sharing oh okay yeah right thank and if, you if some, and if, if there's say two households because they can sit together two households can they should have their individual platters really lovely okay thank yeah. you well, I hope that helps that does help thank you yeah, you would be trying to minimise the, the amount of different people that might be touching the same surfaces. So you, you wouldn't have like a, you know, a container of cutlery where all these different 30 people are dipping okay. into that container to pick it up and potentially yeah. leaving various particles in there for the next person that comes along to pick it up. So you need to think of it in that, in, in that uh, context. And also, um, although these are all, you know, family and friends together, thinking yeah. about if you had it in a buffet style they might all be hanging around that one table and obviously there's no social distancing going on no. there. so um, you need to have a process to still try and separate those different household groups as they get served so you, you do that in the best way you think that's possible in your in your setting okay could I could I have someone you know like one person coming from a family come up say what they want and I have someone serve it into their platter or not is that not a good idea what, what we'll do is um one of us will give you um because you've got some specific queries there we'll come back to you and individually Please, and, and, have, and get really into helpful. the get into the details of your That'd setup great. thank okay. you very much thanks hello hi hi Nathan am I on hi uh, Nathan from smash in Wimbledon hi how are you hello um, it's a question I'm not sure uh, who's directed to, possibly Richard. Um, with maximum party numbers, booking numbers of 30 people, I've heard mixed interpretations of, of what this actually means, um, whether it's maximum of two households, um, etc. Can you just talk me through the, the recommendations there, please? 
So this is on the um, on the number of people allowed to attend uh, an event. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so booking in a in, in a bar, for example. Yeah. So I think again. Um, I'll probably, I mean, I'll, I'll take this one away as well to speak to some of my colleagues. So again, I want to make sure that the advice that we're giving here is is accurate. But to my mind, it is on the consumers to ensure that they don't mix. Uh, and Andrew might uh, jump in here as well, potentially to correct this. But the consumers to ensure that they don't mix uh, household groups when they're in that. The 30 people um, limit for events, which obviously is including staff as well, uh, is fairly onerous and that's not going to change for the time being. So they are very strict on that for inside events. Um, was, what's the, was the question sorry in terms of um so maximum number of households so i just i keep hearing mixed interpretations of what that actually means so whether it's 30 people but maximum two households that seems uh strange so we, we, the there's not going to be 15 people per household um that, that come to a booking you know if i've got no, no, a booking that, that wants, to, wants to book a, a birthday party for example for 30 people I can't say I can't say to them. Well, you can you can only have two households because that's so the households would, to my mind, be the, those that were sitting together within a small proximity. So they would be mixing with um, within that one area, and then you would expect the households to be separated throughout the, the venue. So if you know, I remember something a question in the chat about weddings as well, or wedding receptions, it's the same kind of thing. That um, households would be separated, and you know you'd have a small group of mixing, but then generally speaking, the rest would be so you have these various different pods. Uh, if you set it out in that manner. Yeah, and it's and it's it's worth. I, I totally understand the confusion. It took me a little while to get my head around it. It's worth pointing out that um, if you have uh, uh, an event, so you have a customer that's like you say, you says we're doing a birthday party, we're doing a, an event for us, then thirty is is the max. But if you uh, put on uh, uh, an an event and please correct me if my interpretation is wrong here, but my understanding is if you put on an event and then attracted uh, a range of different people, um, 30 isn't a limit. It, what happens then is you then do a risk assessment looking at the size of your premise, indoor and outdoor space, and assess how many people you could fit uh, at your premise uh, in a socially distanced, sensible manner. So you might have... Uh, something where you've got more than 30 people but it's not it's not all one kind of group of people that are rocking up for a birthday or rocking up for a wedding does that make sense so in, it does Please yeah thank you, thank you. Do, or, or anybody of you have a different interpretation from from that no I'd, I'd agree with that paul that um the 30 person uh gathering limit isn't a venue capacity limit um so yeah so that's just the example if you had a pub quiz um and you'd you'd done your risk assessment you worked out where your tables were being how people could be seated uh so that they were uh socially distanced or there was mitigations in place you don't have to limit the capacity to 30 unless as part of your risk assessment you have already decided that the, the capacity of your venue shouldn't ex exceed 30 uh but yeah so that so for something like that you've you're hosting some sort of event you can have more than 30 or even if you're not hosting an event if your capacity limit on a venue is 50 you can you can go up to 50 uh of customers so it's but it is it's that 30 for a, a specific gathering whether it be a, a birthday party you know a, a function anything like that that's where it starts to starts to kick in in terms of yeah the, great the capacity limit so in theory that's when that's when i can i can say to people yes we can we can take a, a booking for a birthday party of, of 30 people but within within that 30 people you have to make sure that your your households are segregating uh, and, and yeah that's what the guidance says yes yeah, yeah it's uh, yeah it's 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 not it's not particularly clear or useful on that point because it like you like you recognize uh, a 30 person gathering also complying with a requirement of no more than two households doesn't seem to be a very realistic scenario 15 people per household yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, with, um, I've got another this, one if that's okay. But sorry. Go yeah, on. just to just to uh, follow up a, a little bit more on that one as well. It's uh, you know with much of this, uh, you know there is there's quite an onus on the business, you know, to to be asking information, getting a lot of information in advance, uh, and obviously, but there's a limit to what you can reasonably do, and it's all about reasonable steps to minimise risk. So it, it's sufficient for you to have, uh, you know. Um, highlight to them that they need to be mindful of social distancing when they arrive 
uh, keeping in a separate household, but you're not expected to be the police and going from table to table and you know interrogating them. Um, so that's where the, that's where the line is drawn. Yeah, I'd agree with that. You're, you know, there's obviously no expectation that you're supposed to be checking IDs to make sure people are from the same households. Because I mean, that's I mean that's impossible as as it is anyway. But a reasonable step, you know, such that you know the, the way you are have arranged the inside of your venue, for example, it, it enables if it is the two households that they can be seated appropriately. Uh, you might you may when people are making the booking want to ask at least ask the question. Uh, obviously, what people tell you is entirely up to up to them um but yeah it's it's and obviously as a, as a sort of the, the owner of the venue you have ultimate sanction if if you're not comfortable with what's what someone's trying to arrange at your venue you can you can say no and uh, you can refuse admission if you want to i've got another one for for andrew if that's possible if um if i've got a little bit more time yep sure andrew um just regarding bid destruction, I've tried to um, I've tried to sort of look on the website and, and get as much info as possible and um, find the number. I can't seem to, I can't seem to get a couple of specific answers. Um, the cut off time of the end of July. Uh, what exactly does that date represent in terms of being a cut off? So it doesn't mean you can't destroy your beer after that date, but what it does mean is that in in, in setting up this process uh, across the industry. It became apparent that there were lots of uh, water providers that were levying certain costs if you wanted to do this. So we came to a sort of national agreement that certain costs would be waived. Uh, now they they come back to us now and said that's now got to end at the end of August for English pubs. So it's not that you won't be able to do it, but you will potentially start to get charged for doing it by your water provider. Okay, superb. Which which sort of leads me to my next one. I've got. Um, I'm running a venue which hasn't yet reopened um, and we, we don't have a date for reopening yet. Um, I've got several kegs which are going out of date um, in August and beyond. Um, are they still going to be eligible for destruction? Uh, I, I think so. But the thing is, you, you've probably liaised directly with the providers of the beer to see. I mean, are, are you talk, have you got a, a seller? Is that where it's been? Yeah, ma yeah, yeah, seller. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we deal with so predominantly Matthew Clark, um, who... Right, so I mean, it's so. That, I mean, there are a number. There are a couple of alternative options. If you don't want to destroy it, obviously you could try to remove it. But the, the reason for setting up this destruction process is because of the recognition that getting full casks or kegs out of a cellar yeah. is not is not necessarily an easy or risk free process. Um, but I mean, I, I I would I would I would liaise directly with the 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 brewers, the brewing companies, to see if they. Because the, this process enables them to claim back duty for destroyed beer, which then, with the commercial agreement with you, they, they course, either yeah. use that refund to either give you uh, replacement beer or some sort of uh, compensation. Okay, perfect. Um, and, then, and then this one might be a little bit too, too specific, but um, it's worth asking. Um, in terms of some kegs maybe having a damaged label or a cap, um, are they still eligible or is that directly, uh, directly with my supplier? I think you should yeah that that's probably beyond my my uh technical knowledge on this process so yeah I think I think thanks, definitely, anyway. definitely check with them all right thanks for your time cheers thanks Nathan okay um we've got somebody with their hand up labeled who are we P smart if you want to unmute yourself at your end hi I think I, it's Siobhan from Churchill's and St right. John's Hill Hi. Hiya. Um, I just have a question. We have a back garden area, but we need to have a close down by 20 past 11. During the week, it's not an issue. But then on like on a Friday, Saturday, sometimes on a Sunday evening, um, if I don't have room to accommodate the people in the bar that I need to kick out from the outdoor area, is it possible for me to keep that outdoor area open a little longer? It is a residential area right on St. John's Hill. Yeah, so um, Elizabeth, perhaps there's something for you to pick up? I would suggest it, if it is a condition on your license, then is, you yeah. will have to stick with that. There is okay. no way around it because it's after 11 o'clock. So even if the off sales kicks in, you, you've got to stick with your license. You could um, consider, depending on what it was, it would sound like it should be a full variation if you want to change that. But no, I think you have to stick with the conditions on your license 
And then what about outdoor seating? We do have a license for tables, you know, adjacent to the building, uh, but some other establishments have them out on, you know, closer to the road. Is that something that we can do to get, the, you know, this fast track license or um, is you, it something you, that... We you can apply for the pavement license if that's what you're talking about or if if you're talking about putting tables and chairs on the highway that are not part of your um They're premises not area right. then you then you might be looking at a pavement license as long as there is enough room for it and room for people to go past if you're looking at a pavement area depending on what the area is yeah. and about how long would something like that take you're looking at two weeks you've got to put your application in then there is a seven day consultation period and then a seven day decision time okay and you're going to have to put obviously advertise it for the seven days the first seven days the there's a lot of information on um the website there's also a lot of information on the government website but we do have application forms and templates for the notice that you need to put up at your premises to advertise what you're doing and in addition to that, um, you, you said you're a Wandsworth business? No, uh, Battersea, St. John's Hill. In, but in Battersea, okay. Um, so some, some local uh, authorities also um, look at, uh, you know, widening pavements. So if, if, you know, getting a pavement license doesn't, isn't an option because it, there's not enough room to walk past, um, pavement widening and looking at alternatives is something that we can explore. So it's worth um, it's it's worth getting in touch with us and asking about those options to see what uh, what might be possible in your you know near your premise. Okay. Okay. Is there any more? That's great. Thanks. No, that's no. it for me. Thanks. Uh, just while you're thinking about other questions, I'll just uh, pick up these ones that are in the chat. What's the guidance for people wishing to hold a gathering, such as a wedding reception? Uh, well, I think we talked about the, the 30 number, but it, it might also be worth you, you and the person planning the wedding being aware that 1st of October is going to be a big change in terms of uh, lockdown uh, measures and, and numbers of people. From 1st of October, it's then going to be possible for all business events, consumer uh, trade events to start opening up uh, where there may be hundreds of people in a venue and uh, whilst wedding receptions aren't you know included in that particular list that I, that I was browsing um, I would think 1st of October it's highly likely that um, larger uh, parties and weddings will be um, possible. Um, has anybody, anybody else got um, um, yeah, could I just current add information in on that? Yep, yeah, could I just add in? Um, so on, to, on today's day, 29th of July, large wedding receptions or parties shouldn't be happening. You should be sticking to the guidelines of two households indoors or um, six people from different households if you're outdoors. But however, the guidance does say, um, the wedding guidance, that from the 1st of August, um, small wedding receptions will be able to take place. This means sit down meals for no more than 30 people. So that's all it says at the moment. So we'll, we'll accept, expect that to be updated in the coming days. So if you just I'll send this link to this guidance in the chat and if you just keep the, your eyes on the guidance and that should be updated with some further information but hopefully from the 1st of August which is Saturday you'll be able to do a bit more than you currently are able to. Okay great and um, could you manage to have a celebration cake for a, a group event so just to clarify um, are you thinking having a cake and then it being sliced up and shared amongst people is that is that the, the question? This is um, S. Phipps. Uh, so like a wedding cake, is it okay to have a wedding cake and obviously you then slice it up and share it around. So that's, there's no problem having a cake, uh, but just kind of going back to what we were talking about with uh, buffets, uh, you don't want a crowd of different households all coming up and slicing their own piece off uh, the cake. It needs to be done in a way that keeps social distancing in mind, and there isn't sharing of cutlery, uh, so you wouldn't want to have one knife and 30 people all uh, use that same knife to cut the cake, for example. So you need to think about how to do it in a way uh, safely. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Um, if not, just um, feel free to, to add more to the chat or, or uh, unmute yourself. Is there any more um, questions from anyone?
No, and, and it's worth just, we had a question about face coverings, do you need it for takeaways, etc. cetera. So um, Ravina's included in the chat, but just for those others that are just listening to the webinar, um, the text says face coverings mandatory on obviously public transport and some other premises. Um, so includes where food has been purchased at a restaurant without table service or a takeaway outlet. Um, you're expected to wear a face covering. If a shop or cafe has a designated seating area for customers to eat and drink at, face coverings can be removed just in that area only. So hopefully that uh, clarifies um, that. Um, Yeah, with the question about weddings in the chat, is it still necessary to have social distancing, segregation? Uh, so, so yes, it's a lot of this comes down to advanced information. Um, you know, not everybody uh, that's turning up for an event will be uh, up on the you know all the latest social distancing measures. They may have very different attitudes. So it's down to you to point out clearly you know, um, because of social distancing, there's a certain expectation of how the event will be laid out in terms of tables. And you'd be asking whoever is leading uh, the event, please, uh, you know, think about this in terms of uh, making sure that one or the two household bubbles are all at one table. So it's about having that conversation before the day uh, to get them thinking about that. Um, and obviously when they turn up on the day, you would have uh, remind them in some way um, to be mindful of that. Obviously, on a practical level, uh, you know it's very difficult in, a, in an environment where people are celebrating, and and there's a limit to what you're expected as a business to do. Um, the important things for you is advance information, being clear on what measures you've implemented to keep those guests from different households safe, and, and talk about the reasoning. So, for example, if you're doing the cake and you're saying to them. Uh, unfortunately, not all your guests will be able to come up and slice their own cake. Just point to the reasoning because that will uh, typically increase the likelihood of people complying with those requests to act responsibly. I could, I could maybe add to that, Paul, just on that question about wedding receptions. It's also worth bearing in mind that the workplace guidance currently has a strong emphasis not to be doing uh, live entertainment or the sort of entertainment that would uh, cause people to be either breaking down the social distancing or raising their voices so uh, I would take that to mean that even if you were going to be hosting a, a wedding reception for up to 30 people it is probably very likely that you wouldn't be able to have things like a disco there or a, a sort of loud music to celebrate it so it, it's that, that that's something to bear in mind that that's what the guidance is expecting venues to be doing. Definitely definitely I mean remember what we said um, you know talking is enough just talking is enough to spread the particles but the louder you talk the more of these virus containing particles um can be uh, uh will come out of somebody's mouth and um you know people will be turning up and you know they they may have the virus and have no idea and they will be acting accordingly that everything's fine so there's there's lot there's lots of uh there's been some social, um, sorry, behavioral analysis done on previous pandemics uh, and what they found. They looked at people's behaviors and how people adapted to it. And the, the, the really thing to make clear is most people um, had this opinion, it's not gonna happen to me, I'm okay. I've done my bit to keep social distance from people. Um, and, and that is the kind of mentality the average person out there will think if they're not displaying symptoms, they will assume um, that everything's okay with them. Um, and bear in mind, we haven't got a, a you know, huge national comprehensive testing going on. Um, so the, there's a lot of people out there, the majority, 80%, with a virus, with symptom, uh, without displaying symptoms, who will be just going about their business um, as normal. Uh, and I've just I've just seen that Nathan's put a, a question in as well. Um, I think the short answer is it's okay if you obviously can't have two separate a separate entrance and a separate exit, then obviously you have to go with the one entrance exit. But think about the other mitigations. You know whether it's you know can you keep the door permanently open, for example, so that that you don't get people 
trying to get in and out at the same time or you know avoid uh, overuse of the door handle or make sure it's cleaned down at a regular frequency yeah just think of the other mitigations yes yeah exactly i've seen it in restaurants where they have a barrier uh they've got or they've got tape uh, on the floor so it ha there's a visual separation between enter and exit um obviously that isn't possible for places that have a very small entry so you need to think about other ways to to limit the risk uh, as we just discussed um i think that's us there's no more in the in the chat um unless there's any uh last minute questions you'll be able to if you're a business operating in richmond wandsworth or uh, uh, martin you'll be able to call to us directly the rsp for more detailed tailored advice um and that's at rsp at martin.gov.uk uh, and our officer will get back to you um other than that thank you very much um for for joining us um, thank you very much to our, our industry experts um, andrew and richard for giving them their their insights so that's really appreciated and um, we will circulate um, all the information in terms of uh, what I've been touching on, uh, the science, the face coverings, and the different uh, web website information from um, the two organizations as well in terms of their guidance. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody else?